Shabbat Shalom. Welcome to Congregation Yeshua Tzion. Let's open in prayer. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you so much for Shabbat. Hallelujah. Baruch Ata Adonai Hatov Shimcha Ulecha Nae Lehadot. Praised are you, Adonai, to whom all praise is due. Baruch atah Adonai ha-ratzeh b'tishuvah. Praised are you, Adonai, who welcomes repentance. Baruch atah Adonai ha-nun ha-marbeh lis noach. Praised are you, Adonai, gracious and forgiving God. A Psalm of David. The earth is out of noise and all that fills it, <clears throat> the world and those dwelling on it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may go up on the mountain of Adonai? Who may stand in his holy place? <clears throat> One with clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted his soul in vain, nor sworn deceitfully. He will receive a blessing from Adonai, righteousness from God, his salvation. Such is the generation seeking him, seeking your face, even Yaakov. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift up you everlasting doors. The king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? Adonai, strong and mighty. Adonai, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, you everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? Adonai Tzavaot. He is the King of glory. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for sending your son. Help us to let him into those places that we don't want him in. <laughs> thank you, Lord. Quiet our hearts that we might enter into worship today. Thank you for the privilege to come into your presence together. Yeshem Yeshua HaMashiach. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah. Shabbat Shalom. This week we have a double parasha, Tazria and Metzora. That is very loud. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, I'll mention it again. The reason we sometimes have double portions uh, is that the total number of portions does not neatly line up with the total number of weeks on which we'd be reading a portion. So there are some weeks where they will get combined, smashed together. This happens to be one of those. So Tazriah is one portion, Metzara is the second, but they both kind of look at similar things so they get grouped together as part of the rotation. Um, both of these, we are following up uh, last week's Parsha where we are, we're talking about uh, Tumah, impurity, and Tahara, purity, and the, the sort of laws and rituals around what is impure things and what are pure things with respect to ourselves. So l the last Parsha discussed things that make us impure that we come into contact with. We become contaminated if we touch dead bodies or we come into contact with things outside of ourselves. Uh, in these uh, parashiot, we are looking at ways we become contaminated that come from the inside. They are not an outside thing. We became contaminated of ourselves. Um, so in Tazria, which that word comes from conceives, when a woman conceives, uh, we're talking, that's specifically referring to childbirth. So one of these things that can cause a uncleanness that would need to be purified is childbirth. We will also look later in the Parsha about impurities that come from uh, emissions of fluids from within our bodies, whether male or female, blood or otherwise. These things make us unclean, and there's a process prescribed for how do we become clean again once this uncleanness has contaminated us. Um, and in the case of childbirth, and it is somewhat relevant to the other ones as well, there's a cleansing in a mikvah. You go in a bath and you wash and you make yourself physically clean again from this physical uncleanness that has happened. Um, 
We also have an instruction here about circumcision, that on the eighth day of a male boy's life, he will be circumcised. Um, and then we start talking about tzara'at, which is often translated as leprosy, but this is a bit of a misnomer. The second parsha we're looking at, metzara, refers to that word is someone who has tzara'at. That is often mistranslated as a leper, but tzara'at is not leprosy. It shares almost nothing in common with the modern disease, Hansen's disease, that we would call leprosy. They have basically nothing to do with each other, though they are often conflated in a somewhat unfortunate way. Um, Tzara'at is understood to be connected with sin. It's an affliction of the skin, but it doesn't just affect the skin. Real, particularly bad cases of Tzara'at apparently can also affect your family and the house that you live in. So it's spreadable, and also it can affect your clothes and the building of the house that you live in. It's not just a skin affliction. There's something more going on than that. And it's understood to be connected with sin. People afflicted with sara'at would be afflicted with such because of something they have done. So it's something that, again, came from within themselves that has caused this impurity. However, it's not necessarily some sort of physical contamination like a medical disease, necessarily. Um, here in Leviticus, we're not actually told where it's from, only what you're going to do about it. There's a lot of commentary on what causes it and what are the relevant sins that would cause it. Um, most, most often it is thought to be connected to what's referred to as the sins of the mouth. Gossip, slander, libel. Things you say with your mouth contaminate you in a way that you would then be afflicted with this skin affliction or it would sort of permeate your life in your house. Um, but Talmud attaches it to a number of other sins, including murder and envy and uh, theft and other things. But again, here where we're talking about it in Leviticus, it is not described where it comes from. Only what does it look like, how do you spot it, and when you have spotted it, what is supposed to be done about it. Um, so there's a series of instructions to the priest about when you're looking for tzara'at, what are you looking for, and how do you identify it. Um, discolorations of the skin, and do they change color? Do they spread or not spread? Is there hair on it or not hair on it? Does hair grow on it? All these other such things. Um, doctors have tried to connect sara'at to various diseases, medical diseases that we can diagnose, and it doesn't really apply. They've tried to connect it. Of course, there's a sort of loose connection with leprosy, but as we've said, it's not leprosy. It shares almost nothing in common with Hansen's disease, which is a degenerative uh, necrotic illness of the flesh where body parts start falling off. Um, it, they've also tried to connect it to things like vitiligo or psoriasis, which are discolorations of the skin, um, one of which uh, is totally harmless and the other which is not. But again, this sort of misses the point because what we are told about sara'at is the, the thing about the skin discoloration is only sort of how you might identify it, but it's not actually the point and is not actually why we would care about what sara'at is. It's not really an infectious disease that we need to be concerned about it spreading between person to person uh, pathologically. We are concerned about the fact that sara'at is relevant because it is a marker of some sin that we have contaminated ourself with. And it's interesting to note, there's hardly any cases of sara'at mentioned in scripture at all, almost none. There are a handful but specifically, there are only cases of afflictions to people. This idea that sara'at can spread to your clothing is we don't see a case where the, the purification for a house is ever needed to be done. That commandment is actually never known, either in scripture or even in rabbinic tradition, to have ever needed to have been performed. It didn't happen. So that, that makes this thing about sara'at uh, included in uh, what the rabbis consider a series of laws that are intended to teach an idea more than they are intended to command a specific action. So what's that idea then? What, what are we supposed to learn from these commands about sara'at? If it, if it is very uncommon, and some of the things we're told to do around it have actually never happened, what idea should we be sort of learning about this? What will we be taking from it? Well, we've been looking at in the last parsha and this one, this idea that we can become unclean. There are things that contaminate us and make us unclean. Some of them come from the outside, and when we touch things that are dirty or unclean of themselves, or when we eat unclean foods, we become unclean in some way. But some uncleannesses come from the inside. Some of those are sort of everyday and minor, and they include things like our bodies make uncleanness in a sort of physical sense, and that needs to be cleaned in a sort of physical sense. And in these sort of day-to-day -day kinds of uncleanness of childbirth and bodily fluids and so on, the process for becoming clean again has something to do with us. Like we have an action to take, go take a bath. 
if you've become unclean in this very simple and physical way, an important part of the being clean process is don't touch anything that we wouldn't want you to contaminate, like the Torah scroll or don't go up to the bima, and go take a bath and make yourself clean again, and tomorrow you'll be clean. There's an action by which we can cleanse ourselves. But this idea of tsara'at, this affliction, is as related to our sin, we become contaminated by something we can't clean ourselves of. There is no amount of bathing that will make tsara'at go away. God has to do something to cleanse us of this contamination that comes of our sin. The only thing you can do with tsara'at is first identify it. Notice that you have been afflicted with tsara'at and there's a contamination here. You've been made unclean. The rabbi has ways to, or the, uh, the priest has ways to identify, this is tsara'at and here's how I know because God has given me a way to tell. And then you just have to leave and you go out from among the uh, camp and you stay outside until God cleanses you in whatever way he is going to cleanse you. And it requires God to do that from the outside. Once he's done that, then you will ritually bathe and come back in after the priest has identified that, yes, you have become cleansed, but it has to be identified. God had to do that cleansing. You couldn't have done it yourself, and then you are proclaimed to have been clean. Um, and so these things, according to sin, there's this kind of uncleanness that we need to be concerned about that I can't cleanse of myself. But we know it's identifiable. We can see it when it happens. We can see what is this sort of thing. It, there's an effect of this uncleanness that we can see around us. It is, in some sense, potentially contagious. There is concern that, like, if this has happened to you, the people around you will be affected by it. It affects the people around you, your families. It affects your homes. This contamination is not a good thing, and it can spread. And it requires God to do something about it. So should we necessarily be concerned about sara'at, this skin affliction that we're told about in Leviticus? Maybe not necessarily, because we live in a modern era and modern medicine makes us not as concerned about physical, uh, physical illnesses. But as pointed out, this is not so much a physical illness that we're concerned about. We're here to learn a lesson about what does the contamination of sin do to us and what do we need in order to be cleansed of that. And I have scripture. Uh, Luke 1, verses 1 through 4. Now many have undertaken to organize an account of the events fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us from the start by the eyewitnesses and reporters of the word. Therefore, it seemed best to me also, because I have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, to write for you an orderly record, most excellent Theophilus. So you may know for sure the truth of the words you have been taught. Okay. So, before we, before we get into Luke, which we'll get into just briefly today, um, I'll talk about a little bit about Yom Ha'atzma'ot which will be really officially this, this coming Tuesday through Wednesday, which is the, always the fifth of Iyar, uh, the month, the Hebrew month of Iyar. And it's one of four, what I would call modern day observances. I mean, there's lots of observances, uh, but these are, there are four that have been placed on the Jewish calendar. These are not ones that were placed by God necessarily. Yes and no, of course, I would, I would say, if we really expanded what that means, that did God orchestrate these events, which is part of what I want to talk about. Uh, one of those four uh, is Yom HaShoah, which was just, again, the past week in Yom HaTzmoot. We're in the, the time between Yom HaShoah, Yom HaTzmoot. Uh, you also have Yom, uh, Yom HaShoah, of course, being the, the, the day of the tragedy, but the, the Holocaust, more commonly known. Uh, Yom Yerushalayim, which is unification of Israel during the Six-Day War. We have uh, Yom HaZikaron, the day of remembrance, to remember fallen soldiers that fell during uh, Israel's several different or multiple battles in the fight for independence. You've got that as well. And so also that's the third one. And then Yom Ha'atzma'ot, uh, I think literally, literally it's the day of the bones. <laughs> uh, day of the bones It's not really independence, doesn't mean independence, um, but it's the day of the bones. It's M, bone, it's Ha'atzma'ot, bones. And from Ezekiel 37, most of you know about the, the, the bones coming to life. So that's Yom Ha'atzma'ot. Um, often, 
when coupled with Yom HaShoah, if you've ever been to other uh, Holocaust observances, as well as even some of the stuff Dr. Dallaire said today, which is great, what often is sort of the discussion, and I know this was a bit of a, a pet peeve of Rabbi Chaim as well, is if the discussion is solely on human achievement. Uh, you know, Dr. Dallaire mentioned the signature, signatures, and that's very monu monumental, but if, if it's really just on the, 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 the human achievement of never again, and Israel now is a, is a, a superpower, a sovereign state, um, that's often what is coupled with the, the discussion of Yom HaShoah or Yom HaTzma'ot, that Israel is now militarily strong and this won't happen again and we'll stand up for ourselves and, and, and so forth. And of course, on the one hand, on the other, it, it's, it's, that's not a bad thing necessarily. Something is to be celebrated, to, to consider the, the days things were signed and, and the human fortitude and so forth. However, that often creates unnecessary uh, arguments. People that are maybe fine with standing for God, but not so much for Israel. Though now, if you're talking so much about Israel and human achievement, people will talk about, well, that's really Israel itself. It's a godless society. This is a man-made government. It is a secular state. They could talk about corruption and these kind of things. And frankly, those, I think, unfortunately, are a bit of uh, distractions, or what we would call red herrings. Uh, there's a story I told uh, before. Uh, maybe you've seen this video. I can't remember the name of the movie. It's some nature movie. Um, but it's, there's a scene in there, about a three-minute scene of this uh, wild cat feline, this cougar, that comes upon this little baby bear. Have you ever seen that? Little baby bear is just, and they, they add these little almost kid voices to the bear. It almost sounds so cute. He's like, making these noises, it's clearly not the bear, but, but this bear is out there playing all on its own in this cougar season. The cougar starts chasing him. There's this big prolonged chase scene where the cougar is after this bear, and this bear eventually goes out to this river and goes out on a tree limb, and then the tree limb breaks off right when the cougar's about to swipe it, and then the bear's going down the water on this tree limb, and the cougar's following it along the bank, and then finally the bear, little baby bear, is going, making all these noises and it comes up onto this little sandbar and the cougar's right there and he's getting licking his lips and they, the, the, the editing's pretty amazing. And, and then the bear, the, the, the little baby bear is just pretty much cornered and that's it. And so he, he says, ah, 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 and, starts, and he starts you know, yelling at the, at the cougar and you see the cougar, they show the cougar backs off and runs away and then the camera swings around and you see behind the baby bear is the mother bear doing the same thing and you see what's going on there and if it's all and I say it being Yom Hatzma'ot let alone the Shoah if it's all just about yay Israel and, and flag waving based on human achievement then we're really no different than that little baby bear thinking that it was all about him that sent the cougar uh, running so yes focusing on Israel's human achievements can be bad if it ignores and obscures the true basis of Israel's current existence and her sovereignty, which is obviously the, the Sunday school answer, the Lord uh, himself and his larger plan for humanity. That's, what that, that's, that's the mama bear, <laughs> quite frankly, behind any human achievement that's, that's spoken about. And with, with God as the focus, I think that helps clear up some of that obscurity and some of the confusion and frankly, sometimes anger, things that cause, cause disputes uh, when discussing the modern state of Israel. And what you'll face out there, I think even amongst, quite frankly, evangelical uh, Christians, is that you might come across a range of thoughts about Israel. Is, is Israel's existence a, a coincidence that it, Israel exists? Or is it somehow attached to God, but just not sure what to do with it? That's kind of what you run into. It doesn't quite fit in sometimes with the typical evangelical, I'll call it, view of, of the universality of the gospel. Now, there's a gospel for everybody. Why should Israel be so special? Or why should the Jewish people be special? That sometimes is what, what takes place. Well, it's simply because God says so. And you can, you can argue with him because it's, it's really all about him in the first place. Part of what was, uh, oops, sorry about that. Part of what was read today uh, is from Ezekiel 36. Uh, and this is Ezekiel, in the prophet Ezekiel, talking about bringing comfort to the land of Israel. Verse 22 says, Therefore say to the house of Israel, 
Thus says Adonai Elohim. He says, I do not do this, this comforting the house of Israel, but for my holy name, which you profaned among the nations wherever you went. I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned among them. The nations will know that I am Adonai. It is a declaration of Adonai when I am sanctified in you before their eyes. And so it's, a, it's about God is what he's saying. This is for God's sake. And the fact is, is that the establishment and the current existence of Israel isn't a coincidence, but really it's the, it's the down payment. It's the basis for everything else. It's the basis for, for Scripture. It's the basis for God's promises that are laid out in Scripture and all of that. And keeping that in mind, hopefully, steers the conversation away from, or steers things away from, uh, perhaps, political battles. And we're talking about God's sovereignty. And at the end of the day, there's no real clean-cut, I would say easy, definitive answer to the question of, or, or, or a question such as, why the Holocaust? That's something that comes up this time of year. Why? There's really no definitive answer. And there's no man-made explanation as to the establishment of Israel as a modern nation apart from it being the sovereign choice of, of God and part of his plan. And that's where our focus, I think, needs to be on God's character and how he deals with the land of Israel and the Jewish people uh, in Scripture and in the real world. So Yom HaTzma'ot, Israel's uh, independence as a sovereign nation, is it all about that? Yes. But remember that the bedrock is of, of, of that, the bedrock of our remembrance, is God's, God's sovereignty and uh, God's faithfulness. That's got to be the bedrock of all of that. Um, so, if you were wondering, maybe you, you've been at these before, and you were, we're raising it, fla you know, flapping Israeli flags, or whatever, what's that all about? Don't forget the real foundation and bedrock of all of that. So, that's a little, little bit on Yom Hatzma'ot. The Day of the Bones, and uh, we're going to start into the book of Luke. And I don't know how we're going to do that. Are we going to just go verse by verse? I, t I tend to like that. I kind of like to go through chapter by chapter. Will we skip something? I don't know. I don't know. And it's a long book, so it may be a while. There's always things that come up in, in between. Oh, that's the thumbs up. Okay. Uh, there's things that come up in between, but we're going we're gonna to jump into there. So if you want to have your, your book of Luke available, that'd be great. Um, it is the longest book in what we, is often referred to as the, the New Testament, uh, the longest, longest book in there uh, when you pass Second Chronicles and get into those readings, starting with Math, Matthew. It's the longest book. Luke also, uh, you know the, the, the compendium, the, the second volume that, that Luke wrote, uh, the book of Acts as well, the author there. When you put those two books together, Luke and Acts, more verses were written by this person, Luke, than anyone else in the New Testament. He wrote, he wrote the most. A hundred or so verses more than Paul. How about that? And there are some uniquenesses to the book of Luke. Uh, certainly one of the first ones, which we will get to probably next week, is the, the genealogies of Yeshua. Unlike other genealogies in the gospel, uh, Luke traces, his, the uniqueness there is that he traces uh, Yeshua's genealogy back to Adam and sort of looking more at the humanity, of course, of Yeshua. That, that links it there. So there's more discussion of the humanity of Yeshua. He talks more and uses the words uh, that is translated as salvation more than anybody. So a couple of unique things there. There are other things that are un unique about Luke. There's a lot of parables, and, of course. Uh, Luke is uh, thought to be a, a doctor, and we have our, our scriptures to support that. And so people will say, oh, he's a Jewish doctor. must be Jewish because he's, he's a doctor, right? Kind of import that back in time. Possibly. Certainly there are medical terms that we see in the book of Luke. Nothing definitive that he is necessarily Jewish. He does talk about some uh, knowledge, knowledgeable about Jewish stuff. Uh, so possibly. Either way, what we'll say is we would adopt him uh, as a Jew because of the medical background. But... <laughs> Uh, he talks about there in, in verse 2, um, there are medical terms, just for example, when he, when he talks about the idea of being eyewitnesses. The Greek word there is autoptes, 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 autoptes. It actually is where we get our modern word for autopsy. So it is a bit of a medical, medical term there. And 
it occurs only here in, 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 it's not a necessarily a common word that's used in the Koine Greek in the New Testament elsewhere, so it's used just here. And it is that medical term. And in fact, so what we think, you know, Dr. Luke is basically saying is that, hey, we are, and what, what Tony read is we are eyewitnesses. In other words, we are those who performed an autopsy in a sense. Uh, we don't want to import autopsy back into the word. We get autopsy from that word, if you know what I'm saying. But he's saying, hey, we kind of, you can think about it that way, that we did an autopsy and I'm writing to you about the results of that. And we also saw from what, or heard from what Tony said is that Luke was written to Theophilus, that word Theo and Philo, just friend of, friend of God, uh, loved of God, the same uh, addressee that we see in Acts chapter 1 in verse 1 where Luke is writing there as well. So some say that Theophilus is not a real person, but that's just the general idea of those who love God, the friend of God, lovers of God. Um, I, I don't think so, personally. I think that there's more evidence and it's more uh, feasible that really Theophilus, Theoph Theophilus, Theophilus is a real person, not just a generic catchphrase for lovers of God. Nonetheless, uh, it doesn't change the purpose of what Luke says he's writing about, the purpose of building or supporting one's faith, as in verse 4, the, the so then clause or the purpose clause. He says, I've done all this, Theophilus, so, so that or so you may know for sure the truth of the words you have been taught. So regardless whether it's written to people in general, whether it's written to Theophilus himself, it doesn't matter. The, all scripture is useful for us as well. And that the, doesn't change the purpose of building or supporting our faith, the things we find in this book. Uh, we see some things about Luke. We see from the start here that this is not, um, not a corrective that he's writing. He doesn't say, you've been taught several things. There's lots of things been written, and I undertook this project because, man, they really goofed it up, and I'm going to straighten things out. He say, it's just another account. And so I think this does speak to Luke's demeanor and his character, that he's not necessarily a critic, uh, but he is a truth seeker. So that's, I think that's good for us to consider. Uh, in one four as well, Luke didn't address Theophilus uh, in any way that would enable us to know whether Theophilus was struggling with his faith or if he was a strong believer uh, when, when, when Luke wrote those words. We don't know either if, if Theophilus was in danger of abandoning the faith or if he just needed a, a strong foundation for immature faith. Nonetheless, it's uh, valuable for us as we study it, and Luke's introduction promised a factual foundation. It's very clear. These probably, I'm talking about a factual foundation. Foundation, and faith in the Bible and faith in Yeshua doesn't require blindness. Doesn't require require. Sometimes you will be accused of that. You just need blind faith, um, believing things that are contrary to reality or contrary to facts, but believing things that are true and can be supported by facts. That is what faith in the Bible is about, for sure. Luke wrote his introduction to assure his readers that there was actually a, a factual basis for their faith. The gospel tradition was, and it is, reliable. Uh, the, this introduction, as well, tells us that belief in Yeshua and in the, in the study, or the story, I'm sorry, rather, the story of Scripture uh, from Genesis to Revelation isn't some, some myth or some fairy tale. It's not just believing in uh, some unseen or unprovable things, quite the contrary. It's something that can be researched and held up to real scrutiny. And yes, it does involve faith. It's always a both and, right? Um, historically, Luke began his gospel in terms of what he's talking about here in, in history. He, he's talking about events prior to what the other gospels uh, talk about, the other synoptic gospels, the ones that have things in common. Um, Matthew began with Yeshua's birth, Mark began with the commencement of Yeshua's public ministry, but Luke begins with the prediction, predictions of the births of Yohanan, Hamatbil, John the first Baptist, right, John Baptist, and Yeshua. So he goes back a little further, so it's different in that respect. Um, and I'm going to kind of go through some of the other verses here, that, as opposed to having Tony read the whole first 25 verses, I just had her read that little intro. In verse 5, this is where Luke starts. He says, In the day, or in the days, uh, in the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was born a priest, Kohen, named Zechariah from the priestly division of Abijah. Elizabeth, his wife, was from the daughters of Aaron. She was from the priestly line as well. Together they were righteous before Adonai, 
walking without fault in all his commandments and instructions. But they were childless because Elizabeth was barren and both of them were elderly. Now it happened to be Zechariah's time to serve as a Kohen before Adonai in the order of his division. According to the custom of his priestly office, it became his lot to enter the holy place of Adonai and burn incense. So, again, we see that Zechariah and Elizabeth, both from the priestly tribe, they both got, they got married. And it's, it's, it's interesting to note here, Elizabeth was not a sinner. Although barrenness can be associated with God's favor, certainly is. Um, it wasn't that she was a sinner, she was just barren. Despite, the, again, the general understanding that that was seen possibly as a reproach or punishment. And I think, you think, consider Elizabeth for a moment, she had to put up with that, that false assumption, I'm sure. Um, however, as it says in verse 6, it says that she was blameless. Not perfect, she was blameless. Blameless means, when, when you study that a bit, it means that really what, what it's saying about Zechariah and, and Elizabeth is that they dealt with their sin, or they dealt with any sin in their lives quickly. And they dealt with sin in a way that God required. Again, not that they were sinless. It's important to consider that, uh, what that means, because we all, we all do slip, of course. And this Greek word that's used here, it's the equivalent of the Hebrew word uh, tom. Talk about, we've talked about tom quite a bit, not tom like tom. We don't have any toms in this congregation, do we? No toms, look at that. Got one Floyd, right? No Harry's, no Tom Dixon. Anyways, uh, Hebrew word tom, just that, that word that describes Noah, or describes Jacob, describes Job. Um, that's, that's, what's, that's the equivalent of, of how they're described. And their righteousness, that just means wholeness, or a, we can call them a mensch, or just a regular person, or someone that's a, a peaceful person. And their righteousness was due, it says. Look at what their righteousness was due to. It's pretty evil here. Due to following God's mitzvot, his commandments. Those evil commandments, they actually were considered Tom and righteous before God because they followed God's commandments. How about that? Um, you know, when you have a realistic understanding of yourself, you, know, when you get to a point where hopefully you get there sooner than later, where you know who you are. You get a realistic understanding of your strengths, your weaknesses, and all that. Um, it can be hard, I think, to deal with something like Zechariah and Elizabeth were dealing with barrenness, childlessness. They knew they were following God's commandments. They weren't, these were not bad people. They were righteous in, in a sense. They dealt with their sin quickly, but they, were, they dealt with this thing that normally would be a sign of being under reproach or God's, God's judgment. And it can be hard to deal with something like that. However, looking to, to circumstances and yourself and what you see as, as measuring sticks to the goodness that you see and experience in your life that's ultimately a deficient and futile practice to do that. But that's, I think, what, what Elizabeth and Zechariah were, were dealing with, and I think we can relate to. Uh, sometimes the fact is that we're deprived of something in life because God has better things awaiting us down the road. That is true. doesn't mean that's the reason every single time. But when we wait patiently on the Lord, he, he often gives us more than what we imagined possible or what we wanted for ourselves. If you look at the case of Zechariah and Elizabeth, they were praying for a child, a very common thing to pray for. And we're going to see they get a child, but uh, actually they wanted a child and they got a prophet, a little more than what they asked for. As we, as we move on in the text, most of us know the story. Zechariah goes in and, and, and the whole crowd is outside praying and, and Zechariah sees an angel of Adonai appeared to him as he's in the holy, holy place, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Zechariah was in turmoil because he saw the angel, and fear fell upon him. But the angel says, don't be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will give birth to your son, and you will name him John, Yochanan, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. He'll be great before Adonai, and he should not drink wine and intoxicating beverage, but he will be filled with with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, just out of his mother's womb. And so we see that we see the son named, again, Yochanan, God is compassionate from the Hanan, the Hebrew Hanan, the Lord is gracious. You know, Zechariah was old. He knew he was old. His wife Elizabeth was old. He knew she was old. 
Probably didn't tell her if he was smart. <laughs> he just knew it. Yet he was still praying for a son. Interesting. He says, your prayer has been heard. He knew all this stuff, but he was still praying. This is a good application for us, I believe, here. Praying despite the odds, you know. Yes, all kinds of, of plans that we see there for Yohanan that the angel tells him. Uh, those are very important, that what, what he's going to do, what Yohanan's mission in life and plan by God is. Primary, though, and not to be overlooked, is what it says there in verse 14, is that the child was to be a source of joy, gladness, and rejoicing. Just basic blessing and favor from God. And so uh, I thought of, uh, and this probably will never end for me, but the words of Rabbi Chaim ringing in my ear, you know, don't assume, as Chaim used to say, that God's only interested in, oh, you're having fun there? Ah, sorry, John, we're going we're gonna to squash that. He used to talk about that. Chaim said, God, you know, some people think that if you're having fun, God's saying, no, we're going we're gonna to squash that. This, the birth of John, amongst all the other things that are talked about there, John says, look, he's going to be a source of joy and gladness and rejoicing, just basic blessing and favor from God. He's also going to be, uh, prior to Acts chapter 2, I know I harp on this a lot, but there was a filling of the Holy Spirit. He was going to be filled with the Ruach. Yes, different after, after Acts chapter 2, but certainly not unheard of. Um, and then we see verse, in verse 17, it says, He will go, this is John, will go before him, him, obviously speaking of Yeshua, in the, in the spirit and power of Eliyahu, of Elijah, to turn the hearts of fathers to the children and the disobedient ones to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready for Adonai a prepared people. You know, part and parcel of the preparation that, that John ushered in for the coming of Messiah was for people to first be turned to God. And part of that would be a healing of relationships, the text talks about. Families, fathers with their, with their kids, and moreover, just a general turning of disobedience. And this is the true work of God, something we absolutely cannot do ourselves. <laughs> you know, we can't change hearts like what's described here. This is the description of, of changing of hearts. Yes, he's preparing the way for the Messiah. It's not all about the Messiah, though. Prior to that, he's saying these things need to get straight. Did Messiah come to offer eternal life? Absolutely. But so much more, even in the current life in terms of relationships, in terms of, of tilling and softening up the soil first, is what the text says, before, before the ushering in of Yeshua. And boy, man, is that something that's ever necessary for, for us at all times, day by day. One author, when I was reading about, about this section, said this, said, the life and mission of Yochanan and the role he played are indications of the detail God took in reaching out to save humanity. He didn't just send a savior. He sent someone to point the way to him. And God often leaves indicators that he is at work if we just keep our eyes and hearts open for them. Rarely does he just show up. In addition, Yeshua didn't come just to make us right with God and to give us forgiveness. As we see here, he called people to be prepared to receive his, his coming. He wants us to embrace a new way of life, not as the basis of salvation, but in response to his goodness. Repentance, the turning of a heart to be open to him, is the door through which grace is offered and faith planted. So don't overlook the preparation that John was doing, not just, hey, get ready, Yeshua's coming. He said, and you need to get right with each other. You need to, the disobedient ones need to turn. It's a much bigger picture in that. So getting right with God is good. It's not more than good. It's great. It's necessary. It's, it's uh, very clear in Scripture. However, absent more close relationship healing amongst the stuff we deal with every day, it's a bit of putting the cart before the horse. This is not just, and I've seen, you see this in other places in Scripture, the idea that, well, I love God, but I don't care too much for Raphael. I mean, we, we, we you know. That's, you can't do that. It doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. So absent that, it's, it's putting the cart before the hearse. That b b cart before the horse, that's all a, a precursor to Yeshua coming. That's what's being described in the text here. In verse 18, Zechariah said to the angel, after hearing all this, How will I know this for certain? I'm an old man, 
and my wife is well advanced in age. That's a real euphemism. Well advanced in age. Like mature. And so Zechariah heard all this stuff and he certainly zeroed in on one, or he certainly zeroed in on the personal aspect. Uh, the talk, you know, he heard about this child's going to do all these things, he's going to turn people to each other to heal relationships and turn them to the Lord. Um, and all John's thinking about, you said I'm going to have a son. He's, his mind was kind of still stuck there, thinking about that. He zeroed in on that. Zeroed in on that. Um, and the angel did talk about more than that. And that could be part of the reason for what we know, if, if you know the story, you know, the, the punishment, the being mute, and possibly some say that he couldn't hear as well, or couldn't speak as well. Um, I mean, speak and hear as well. That could be part of the punishment, uh, the doubt about that, but also, I think, seemingly his ignorance of the fullness of what his son would usher in and just kind of focusing just on the, what about my son again? How's this going to happen? I think that was uh, part of it. In other words, it wasn't all about, it really wasn't all about Zechariah, and it shouldn't be all about you either. It shouldn't just zero in on that personal aspect of you talk about all these great things that are going to happen, but what is it? How are we going to have this son? That was just, that's all uh, um, Zechariah seemed to think about. And some interesting things here when, for us to consider is that, you know, we, we hear God often. We know what he says. But then we feel that we have a need to remind him of who we are and what we are and are not capable of, you know. He, just, he gets told this story from God and God, he says, oh, yeah, but you know I'm old and she's well advanced in years. <laughs> we like to remind God of who we are and, and what, what we are and what we're not capable of. And the fact is, God knows who you are. As Dr. Dallaire said the other week, everything's uncovered and laid bare before him who must, we must give account, you know. Um, God knows who we are. You can be naked in front of him. We can be transparent with each other. We don't have to be naked. Haim used to say that as well. Be transparent, <laughs> be transparent but not naked. But we're naked before God. He knows who you are and, and what he's capable of doing with you and through you. And there's no need to correct him. You know, there's times we just need to accept what God says and take it at face value. You know, it's kind of like if you... Sometimes you just need to accept it and move on. The more, you, the more talking you do, the more reminding you do, the worse. You, know, you get pulled over by the police and, and you, you want to tell them the story of why you were late. And all the while he's saying, you know, you can go. Well, yeah, but you see, I was on my... Just go. Just shut up. Don't talk anymore. The more you talk is going to cause trouble. Just take, take the, the, the warning and go. You know, sometimes we feel like we want to talk. We, we ruin it by saying anything else. I've already said you can go. Just best if you would be quiet. Um, moving on, verses 19 and following says, And speaking to him, the angel declared, I am Gabriel, the one standing in God's presence. I was commissioned to tell you and proclaim to you this good news. So, Look, you'll be silent and powerless to speak until the day these things happen, since you didn't believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And so we, we see God's chastisement, if you will, in this situation. But we do know that ultimately that did reap dividends. When we read further along, when, 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 his, when Zechariah's mouth finally did open, uh, maybe even his hearing restored. His first words were those of praise to God. So it was, it was good stuff that came from this. This has to happen sometimes, every once in a while. Uh, verse 21 says, The people were waiting for Zechariah, wondering about his delay in the holy place. But when he came out, he couldn't speak to them. And they, they realized he must have seen a vision in the holy place. He was making signs to them, but remained mute. And when the days of his priestly service had been completed, he went home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant, and he and hid herself for five months, saying, Adonai has done this for me. In these days, he looked upon me to take away my disgrace among the people. So we do know she was definitely struggling with, with her life there. And, you know, there are, there are lots of things that can bring disappointment in life. There certainly are, I think. Uh, we see, we, we know a little bit about Elizabeth and Zechariah's, uh, Zechariah's situation. We see that Elizabeth and Zechariah, however... They weren't bitter about it. We do see they. I think we can we can see learn something important. They were continually faithful, uh, despite what we know they'd been experiencing and going through in their life. Uh, Zechariah was serving, even even though they certainly felt the disappointment, that disgrace felt by Elizabeth. And sometimes I think underestimating God, underestimating God, God is just about as dangerous as rebelling against Him underestimating him. 
And will we have doubts in life? Of course. Will they be based on what we know about ourselves or what we know the facts in life are all about? Sure. But does that change anything regarding God's perspective on, on things? Does that change anything regarding God's plans and purposes? The answer is no. And as we, as we see with, with Zechariah and Elizabeth, our job is to stay the course, we pray, we continue to serve, we don't you know, make notes and, and let our short, shortcomings become permanent debilitations, we don't have to remind God about those things, and we take the opportunity as did Zechariah, and as will Elizabeth, and as will, as we'll see, Miriam, Mary, and on and on. We take those opportunities to, to praise the Lord. So let's, let's do that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today, specifically, that we can remember your faithfulness to your people Israel, that faithfulness which is the foundation for our beliefs overall in you and your word. It's a remembrance that should bring belief and blessing to the entire world. Yes, it focuses on Israel, but may the focus be on you and understand you in this, in this uh, remembrance. We thank you for the story of the birth of Yochanan and how with it you show us your desire to bring joy to each one of us, to bring healing to the world, and that starts with healing between one another. We ask, Lord, you would help us to, to trust in you, to trust in your promises, despite what we know about ourselves and the world around us. Help us, Lord, to remain faithful in our service to you in the arenas that you've placed us in. Help us to remain faithful in those areas despite all the things that might still be going on as parents, as children, as siblings, as employees, and as servants and as representatives of you. We pray all this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Jimmy? Jimbo? Thank you, Rabbi David, for that awesome message. We're going to close with the ironic benediction. God commanded Moses and Aaron to put his name on the children of Israel with this benediction. Yiborechecha Adonai ve'yishmerecha Ya'er Adonai panabelecha ve'chunecha May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face toward you and give you his shalom. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>